Welcome to the latest edition of the Reimagine Mobility podcast series. I'm here with Joe Grace. Joe recently retired from a long career at uh, Chrysler, Daimler Chrysler, Stellantis. He's going to be a whole lot better explaining to us uh, all the different names. But great career, lots of different areas. So super excited to have you on to kind of get your perspective throughout the years, how you've seen mobility changed. And now that you're maybe with at least half a foot outside of uh, work, also a little bit, give us an idea. Where do you see mobility go now that you're on the outside, uh, maybe on the outside looking in, right? So Joe, welcome. Maybe give us a quick overview of your career, what you've done. And then let's dive in together and reimagine mobility together. All right. No, thanks, Stefan. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, I, I retired from Stellantis at the end of June uh, this year after uh, a little over 38 years. Started my career at Chrysler down in Highland Park. Um, largely in the first chapter, was in the body engineering area. Then I went into manufacturing for a short stint, um, I was responsible for quality uh, at one of our assembly plants in Canada. Came back um, into the body group for a short period, and then then I moved. I moved into vehicle development uh, in the late '90s, and then started a whole new chapter, working on vehicle programs, vehicle projects. That led to uh, being responsible for the what became the L platform, the rear wheel drive cars, uh, what became the Chrysler 300, the Dodge Charger, the Dodge Magnum, the Dodge Challenger. Um, and then from there worked in program management uh, and led to then the uh, relationship we had with Fiat um, under FCA. And, uh, and during that period, the early period, I was responsible for the bringing the Fiat 500 to North America. I had the SRT programs, so all the performance cars, the the re uh, the last generation of the Viper, um, also the NASCAR, the motorsports activity, and then uh, went from there into the advanced engineering organization. Led that um, still as part of FCA, and then I had a great opportunity. Kind of at the end of the SCA chapter, I was uh, I was I had the opportunity to leave the the group of Maserati and Alfa Romeo. I lived in Modena for three years and led the development of uh, what's now all of the portfolio of the Maserati vehicles that are launching uh, the uh, mid cycle of the Alfa Romeo, the Giulia, and the Stelvio, and then all the other Alfa products. Um, and then I came back, and that was right at the onset of uh, what's now Stellantis. And I had headed up globally the Vehicle Development Vehicle Integration Organization, which is called uh, Physical and Functional Design and Integration. So all of the safety, NVH, aerothermal, all of the validation, all of the advanced engineering still that supports the new programs, so all of the work with the studios, uh, the energy management, which is now becoming very topical with all of the battery electric programs. So that was a great opportunity. And then last summer, I uh, passed on the torch to uh, to new leadership and have now started kind of this next chapter. And and I yeah, and I've stayed close to the activities that are still going on, and still obviously staying very close to what's happening in industry. It's uh, an amazingly complicated and uh, really a. Uh, if you look at the last 38 years as somewhat of an evolution, now it's a revolution. This is uh, a step function change um, in the products. And uh, and so it's, it's an exciting time for the industry. That's incredible background, Joe. It is amazing to hear, you know, again, 300, right, an icon. I remember I worked for Huntsville Electronics at that point, and everybody talked about, oh, this car is coming out. I'm like, what are you guys are talking about? Then I saw a picture. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is cool, you know. And then, you know, the Viper, I drove that many times during testing phases. Not a great car. And not a great car in a different way to Fiat 500, right? Something totally different for the U.S. market. 
and all these other things you've talked about. And then, frankly, you worked for a pure American company, then for a German-American company, then for Italian-American company, and now at the end then of a French-Italian-American company. With all that, again, from product and what you just mentioned, you know, the electrification, the revolution, the, the total transformation, the technology and the different cultures, if you kind of take that in and, and say, you know, you shake it five times and up co out comes this, whatever, this drink or this soup or whatever, where is mobility going? Where do you see it going, at least with maybe in, in this space that you're familiar with? Yeah, it, I mean, it's... It's, it's a really, I'll say, globally complicated situation. You know, obviously, all manufacturers, to the extent that they're most of the, certainly the larger companies are all global enterprises. So trying to service all the different major regions of the world, China, Europe, North America, South America is growing, Asia is growing outside of China. And it's really complicated to try to then develop solutions that you can have the right scale to then do well in the markets and be profitable and face all of these regulatory pressures that uh, are still rapidly changing. And, uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot, obviously a lot of different feelings about climate change and is it, is it real? Is it happening? Is it reversible? Uh, you know, the commitments certainly in Europe and to an extent in China is just in terms of their pressure on electrification. But in Europe, you know, they're they're ahead of the United States for sure in terms of uh, pressure to change, getting, we'll say, that the, the broader population to accept change and then to try to develop products that essentially respect the pressures that... Europe has these incredibly complicated, not just regulations with respect to the initial certification of the vehicle, but then they have registration taxes and blocks entering cities if you don't have uh, the right propulsion system, you know, and everything is gravitating from combustion engines. And, you know, Italy just a few years ago was 80% uh, diesel, you know, and, and now that's changing and basically the growth of electric vehicles in Europe is, I think is, is clear, you know, it's, it's happening. Uh, I would say the, you know, the somewhat of a jump kind of past hybrids then into pure electrics, but clearly that's not the situation in North America. North America is still somewhat in a transition. There's a lot of a suspicion from consumers on, okay, is this the right type of product for me? Is it going to meet all of my needs? So it's, it's a really complicated set of trying to get the right range, the right cost, the right price point to the consumer, and then to meet their expectations on performance. Cause uh, you know, the, in the end of the day, it's the consumer that puts their money out and either wants to buy or doesn't want to buy these vehicles. And so now the manufacturers are, are in a really complicated situation because they're most are somewhat all in on new platforms, heavily electrified. And it's, you know, it's uncertain on the, the response that the consumers will have. You know, I think you brought up a very good point or maybe inadvertently you brought it up. Um, you talked about Europe going from hybrids to now pure electric, and it's really taken off, right? If you look at statistics right now, I think about a month ago, I looked, the U.S. is projected to sell about 1.1 million EVs this year, significantly below what Germany alone, a much, much smaller market than the U.S. is, uh, is selling. The one thing I always a little bit looked at is to said. Europe went from diesel or gasoline to hybrid for an extensive period of time. And then sort of now is government push, uh, social, social pressure, environmental, sustainability, all of the good stuff. Now jump it over to pure EVs. In the U.S., I feel like we've never went through that phase of, of hybrids. We sort of jumped from more or less gasoline, I would say, to battery electric. 
do you see this, if you look again, as we reimagine mobility for a moment here on the powertrain side at least, do you see this something that the U.S. made a mistake? Did we, did we think we needed to jump? Did we think we needed to because government is pushing us? Did we think we could just jump right there because hybrids is more kind of a, a transitionary solution? Because now, that's my last point I'm making before I let you talk here is, because now you're seeing other OEMs in the U.S. that haven't for years talked about hybrids suddenly talk about hybrids again. Correct. So, would be lost to hear your your perspective on. That. Yeah, it's you know it's a, uh, and then of course you have hybrids, and then you have plug-in hybrids, and even range-extended electric vehicles that have a you know a gas engine generator that's making electrical power, but then still a, a fully electric propulsion system with variable sized batteries, you know, the, you know, all the way from the minimum battery to some, in some cases, now you'll start to see larger batteries that can kind of essentially give the consumer the EV experience if they want to plug in and charge up and it meets their drive cycle. But then if they consume the battery, then they still have the ability to, you know, get the gas, the gas engine generator to make electrical power and still keep them on their way. And then of course you have different size gas tanks too. So it's, 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 it's a really complicated set. I think, you know, I know, you know, um, you know, the hybrid plug-in hybrid vehicles are very complicated because you have all of the emission requirements for the engine, which are then can continue to be ratcheted up more and more um, severe. And then you have the electrification side with the electric motors and uh, all of the basically powertrain electronics that comes with those programs. So it's, in some respects, it's the most complicated solution. So if you can get, and this is, I think, what some of the manufacturers are counting on is trying to get to a full electric solution that then, of course, is zero emissions, then do it at an effective cost point but then still give the consumer the range that they need to have to then do what they want to do. And I think that's part of the hesitation in North America because the, the drive cycles, you know, a lot of people have the you know, major highway driving, covering big distances. And then, of course, the U.S. is like no other country with respect to towing. And, and obviously the truck market is, is huge in North America. So you have these pickup truck owners that are used to doing, carrying heavy payloads, towing, covering large distances, cold weather, all of these things that then are really complicated on, on an EV. So you wind up with potentially, uh, and I think you're seeing that now with the offerings from, from Ford and from General Motors. And now we've got the cyber truck coming right out now with, uh, all kinds of technology and, you know, but it's, it's got to meet the consumer, the needs, you know, if the, if it's not accepted as a, as a kind of quote unquote there, you have the, the broad category of lifestyle trucks and then work trucks, you know, and the people that are looking for a work truck, uh, the cover distance, to car carry payload, to tow the electrified solutions are really, are really tough to meet all of their, all their needs. So. If, if we leave for a moment propulsion systems, you've been involved with so many other things. Where do you see over the next five years the biggest advancements in passenger? Let's stay with passenger vehicles, obviously. In passenger vehicles, do you see it in in how we how we design and how we use chassis to an advantage to differentiate? Is it the infotainment system that I think over the last ten, maybe fifteen years has consistently involved today? You have, you know, in some cases, bigger screens. Uh, in your card and what I'm looking at right now here on my laptop, is it is it how we use data to provide services and really, you know, make money through this, but not just money, but also truly value back to the consumer? Where do you see over the next five years the, the biggest leapfrogging in technology or the biggest changes coming? Yeah, that's that's a that's a great question because it's uh, that's another just an incredibly complicated and really interesting area because you have 
a general trend, not just in automotive, but in, in consumer electronics towards subscription services. You know, and then this in itself is somewhat of a hook for companies that want to basically draw some, you know, ongoing subscription revenue for for different things. So you have possibly so the in the example of uh, you know assisted driving assistance all the way from call it highway assist level two type systems to hands free systems level three and then ultimately you know potentially autonomous vehicles level four which I think there you know there remains a lot of interest in these systems but then it becomes okay, you need mapping solutions, you need technology, you need communication. So when a customer buys a vehicle, are they getting, call it that, that technology, that feature for, for life, you know, for the, for the ownership at, at call it at its technology level when they first buy the vehicle or no, in fact, that becomes a subscription. So you get your first three months, six months, free with the vehicle, but then if you want that feature to still function, you're going to be paying, you know, X dollars a month. And I think there's, there's some real risk in that because I think people are generally, you see that now even with satellite radio and other things, and then you have your wireless service, but those things are coming. And, and, and so will that be an attractive proposition to the customer? And then, you know, clearly the, hands-free or autonomous vehicles. And you're seeing this now even, you know, kind of with the, what's happening with cruise automation and, you know, it's the, these systems are wildly complicated and, and then the uh, redundancies and other things, fail safe mechanisms that need to be in, you know, in the basic hardware setup of the vehicle. So you have redundant steering, you have redu redundant signals. Sometimes you have redundant processors you know, redundant motors, you know, they become very expensive. So, so that, so this whole, eco, so the economics of the assisted driving and then kind of what consumers really want to have, uh, you know, there's clearly, there's a move towards highway assist, you know, kind of highway driving with uh, type one highways that have limited access points. You know, you can kind of monitor that at a vehicle level a lot more easily than you can wide open city driving. And then of course, all of the craziness that can happen, you know, in city environments. And you see in Europe, and Europe is still, they're moving very slowly on this. They're, they're, they're somewhat blocking by way of regulation, you know, the, some of these advanced technology features. And I, and I think some of that's justified. It's, uh, it's, there's a lot of, failure points and a lot of things can go wrong. So I, so I think there's, so that's one big question is how, how much interest will there be in the top, you know, kind of all these levels of autonomous driving. And then of course the viability at the end of having autonomous vehicles that are, you know, not, not driven or not even require a human kind of ready to take, take command. And then are consumers going to want to have a, a subscription car service? You know they're they're not going to want to own a car anymore. They're just going to just like they do with the Uber. They'll call up an Uber and then they'll have a car show up, and it might not. It won't in the end game. It won't even have a driver. Um, so that's one whole big thing. And then this, then the you mentioned the infotainment and the screens. Uh, you know, I think there's still a clear preference to have one screen for the for the driver assuming there's still a driver then then a kind of a, a screen to share in the center and then of course you've now seen some vehicles with pe even pe you know dedicated passenger side screens and then rear seat entertainment which was a big thing for a while but now with all of the people with their own personal devices um you know that that seems to be somewhat of something that's i'll say moving into the past and then, and then of course, uh, the preference of consumers to have functional, you know, a, a mirroring of either their iPhone or their, their, their droid phone and not to be bothered with trying to figure out how all of the, the OEM based systems work is they just, they just want to connect their phone 
and and use their phone. So so then there's that's another big kind of game changer for the manufacturers is that do you just have a, essentially a screen where you're just porting in the information? But then of course there's times when the phones lose their signal and lose their you know. So you have to have all these backups. So it's it is and then on top of that, so you've got the assisted driving, the infotainment, and then you've got the electrification, which has different driving modes, different regen modes possible, all kinds of in the range calculations, the battery life percent. It's you're you know, what's of concern is we're we're starting to overload the, the customers with too much information. And the dealers of the oil gas trouble ten yes, and then the the poor service technician that's uh, <laughs> yeah. and it all works. So, it's... so Joe, I got I got two more questions before we end up here. So the one is very interested if you can share a little bit in your career, maybe at the beginning of the career, the middle, or at the very end. What was what was the one or maybe two companies or products, if it's a specific product? that you looked up and say, they really sort of have it figured out, at least in maybe in one portion, maybe on the powertrain side or on the design side or, or infotainment, as we just talked about. But what, what was one or two of those companies or products that you, again, in your position or one of the positions you were in, looked up and say, you know what, as I look at it, that point in time, looking into how do I see the the future and, and, and motion, mobility, reimagine, I think they got it. You know, I think this is somebody I want to watch to maybe kind of get some inspiration from. Is, is there such a thing or was it more always internally focused and what your marketing guys came up with? Well, you know, I, I, that's a great question. I, there's a couple of things that just pop into, into my my mind, you know, I, I would say in the call it in the pre-electrification space, you know, kind of the the end of the last era of advanced combustion engines. You know, a company that just stood out to me, just consistently making great benchmark product, BMW, uh, propulsion systems, driving dynamics, keeping call it that user interface somewhat simple. Um, and understandable, but really it's just a great, a great machine, uh, in terms of like a road vehicle, you know, so that, that pops to mind that the, maybe, maybe if I need to check there quickly, sorry, you think they still can do this? Because I, I think I agree with you, what you're saying. You think they can still do this with EVs or is it, is it much more difficult? It, it, it to me, it becomes much more difficult, and uh, this, you know, this is a general point, and it's a challenge really to all the manufacturers because. And you, you talked about, you talked to your question about passenger cars. You know, there's so much pressure on aerodynamics. There's so much pressure on call it being energy efficient, and if you look just at basic shapes and aerodynamic efficiency, you have a general shape for a sedan that will realize good aero. And then you have a general shape for a, a crossover UV, call it a slightly taller package. And so what you're seeing is the vehicles are now started to, to blend together. It's, it's much harder to differentiate the vehicles. And then of course, electrified vehicles with their electric motors and their instant power are posting incredible performance numbers that you never saw on gas engine vehicles and only in the most extreme, you know, take the, 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 the demon, the challenger, you know, kind of the extreme propulsion systems that, uh, that we've added, uh, at Chrysler Stellantis. And, and so the, so there's a, to me, there's a convergence now of shape and, performance and then the, how do you differentiate and give that kind of your your consistent with your brand and your heritage a different experience that still then resonates with the consumer and makes them want to buy your vehicle so so jeep is i think an example is doing a good job it's uh we've got the the phev wrangler it's doing quite well number one selling phev in the united states it's still 
consistent with its heritage for performance, you know, off-road performance. But obviously at a arrow penalty and other things that are not quite so efficient, but it still resonates with the consumer. So, so it, yeah, we're entering And then in the, uh, in the electrification space, you know, credits due to Tesla for continuing to, to push and press, uh, the model three and the model Y super efficient vehicles, energy efficiency, uh, you know, almost off the charts. But again, it kind of uh, a lot of people find the the Model Y shape, you know, not so attractive. But it's but it's efficient, and and so they're pushing this space and efficiency. Lucid now, uh, very efficient vehicle, very expensive. Uh, trying now, I think they're adjusting their price points to try to get something that's more reachable for the consumer. But we'll see. But you know, these vehicles are very expensive too. With the, the bigger the batteries. 100 kilowatt hour batteries that are uh, still and heavy, heavy. And so those, those kind of come to mind immediately. Okay. Well, that's good. And the last question, what's going to be the next car you buy and why, Joe? Well, I'll, I'll say what we have, uh, you know, we still have a Durango, a five, seven Durango, um, we tow, we have a boat. We tow it from Michigan down to Florida and back. You know, we're going 1,300 miles towing. Uh, we would have a, a ram, uh, but, you know, the the preference to have kind of a, a UV for for the family. And um, so that's that's our, call it our, our current go-to vehicle. Uh, I, I am biased towards, uh, I think that, the Grand Cherokee is a wonderful product. You see now the PHEV for the Grand Cherokee that could be in our, our near future. And then we'll see. We'll see about an EV at some point in time. I think uh, I'm going to be one of those uh, North Americans that I think transitions first to a PHEV. Well, I'll ultimately do a, an EV when, when the time fit. There you go. Perfect. Joe, thank you so much for your time and uh, for helping us reimagine mobility from, from your perspective here. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Reimagine Mobility Podcast. If you like this episode, please subscribe and tell a friend.